Yep. Okay. So, hi guys. Um, I'm uh, Stephen Human, and I'm going to be presenting a new piece of software, which is not Clip Copy Plus, although I'll be demonstrating something related to that. Um, so, nowadays we have lots of disk images out there online, and you might want to use those in, with your Apple II computer, but it can sometimes be kind of challenging to get them to your Apple II. So, we have two GSs nowadays that can actually access the internet. So I thought, can we come up with a really convenient way to access those disk images online from an Apple II GS? And so for example, here we have uh, this uh, Clip Copy Plus, which is a thing that uh, uh, Chris Vavruska came out with fairly recently, which is a nice finder extension that allows you to copy things. But for the other purposes, um, it looks kind of strange on this, but OK. So we copy the link um, to a disk image. And in, in a real GS, let's see here, uh, real normal size. And actually, just uh, full screen. OK. So we'd like to access that disk image um, right on our GS. And in this case, it's an emulator, obviously. But um, in a real GS, you would need an Ethernet card, essentially, to use this. And so the thing I've come out with is called NetDisk. And it has a couple of parts. But here, we've got a control panel. So you want to access this uh, disk image. And we can, in this case, I'll just paste the URL here. Um, and then we can click Mount Disk Image. And that's it. We have, we can auto, we have various formats here, but we can leave it on Auto Detect. So we just click Mount Disk Image. On, and again, this can be any 2GS um, <coughs> with an um, Ethernet connection or <coughs> theoretically anything that works with Marinetti, so you have TCP IP. Uh, so we click Mount Disk Image. And we just have this disk image showing up right here, just like uh, you stuck it in a floppy drive, except it's read only. And it's on your finder desktop here, so you can access it. And you can access the files on it. And as you're doing this, this is all going over the internet and reading this data. But it's, um, it's accessible on your 2GS just as if you uh, had an actual physical floppy there. And you don't have to deal with really copying the disk image or anything. You just kind of put in the URL, and that's it. So that's a pretty convenient way to access things. And, oh, in this case, uh, you, you would copy this thing over to your system folder. So we can just do that. Um, and again, it's the end of the thing. I have it already, actually. Um, but uh, it would work. Uh, you can just copy things like you would. You can also copy the whole disk onto a local disk if you want to. So that's pretty neat. But can we do something even more convenient than that? And so that I showed you have to kind of manually uh, enter the URL, which, by the way, you can use URL shortening services if you want something more convenient to enter. Uh, the a2.click, uh, Apple II specific one, definitely works. And most others should as well. Um, but is there something even more convenient than typing that URL manually? Well, you know, one place that has a lot of disk images is archive.org, the Internet Archive. So can we just uh, look at this and search for something and find it? So for example, um, a game I like is called Dual Trust. So we search for that. This is searching all the disk images for, in this case, the Apple II GS. You can do any Apple II too, although there are some limitations with 8-bit stuff. But you just uh, search for your disk image here. Um, you found it. In this case, there are actually a couple of them. We'll just pick the first one. You could go through them, and there might be different versions or something. Um, but we just double click it, or we click it, and click uh, Mount Disk. And in a moment here, we've got our disk image. And again, this is all mounted over the internet. We haven't actually downloaded the whole disk image. We just will we'll fetch the data over the internet as we need it. And so again, we can go ahead and do that. And we can actually run the program. And again, that's going over the internet. Yeah? You said you're not fetching the disk image, so you're streaming dual trust, basically? Um, yes, basically. So does that, I mean, do you need to have as much hard drive space as dual trust would take up? Or? Um, no, you don't actually need any hard drive space. In this case, I mean, that, that's not a floppy, so you, you might. But, but it's essentially, you'll load the data you need directly into memory. Yeah. See. Yeah, uh, in the back. Related question, then. Floating directly into memory, do you, how do you handle images that are larger than RAM? Um, again, it's it basically works like you have. No, sorry, this is. It, it works like you have a disk drive, like a hard disk drive that can be larger than RAM, obviously. And it's essentially. Uh, let's get out of this. Um, 
Um, it's essentially just going to load whatever blocks from the disk you need. And it's going to load those specific regions of bytes from, from the server to access them. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, you, you can download these from. Um, yes, you can download them. Uh, let's see, get out of here. And that's that. Uh, you download them from my website here, where it was uh, just released, uh, which is uh, shuman.github.io slash netdesk. Or you can also just go to my GitHub page and uh, there are downloads um, right here. Um, it's also on GitHub, so all the source code is there. Um, and you can feel free to play around with it and try to enhance it or whatever. Um, one thing you do need, the latest version of Marinetti, which just came out yesterday, so download that first and then download this. And it should work. <laughs> okay. And You've, uh, you've achieved my dream of the Internet Archive being everyone's Apple II GS storage <laughs> cider. So that's really appreciated. All right, so, <laughs> so how many of you have seen the marathon slot that's sitting on the thing? Only Ken and a smattering of others. Okay, has anyone figured out what that is yet? How many people have heard me talk about this thing? All right, so I wanted to try something. Now, obviously, all traditions start with somebody doing something wrong, and then it either takes off or it doesn't. So we're going to do an experiment with a version 1.0 of this idea. And a number of, orga a number of conferences have had this uh, of varying types. Uh, but I wanted to try an Apple II spin on it. The closest one that most people know is the Omegathon with PAX East and PAX West. But there's other variations out there, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to set up five Apple IIs, and with those five Apple IIs are going to be ten floppies piece. And you're going to each pop in the five contestants, the five warriors, the five brave people, and I'll be asking for who those five people are, along with a few extras in case they realize at night looking at the moon that they're not up to the task. Um, you will be sitting in front of these machines. You will put in disk number one. It will have an instruction. And you will attempt to do that as fast as you can using your decades-long skill with the Apple II. And then, having done it with your referee and other referees, you can then go to disk number two. And we'll see who can get through all 10 first. And we might not ever get to 10, but we probably will. And if it's fun, if it's a joyful thing, there are variations to the rules. There are ways to do it. There are more apples we can set up. We can try it. So what I'm looking for are five contestants, five people who feel as comfortable playing an arcade game as working a spreadsheet, as comfortable as working a database as they are to beat sneakers. People who are, in their minds, the greatest Apple II users ever to exist, who have been able to bless us with your presence for this Kansas Fest. If, after a lot of soul searching, you feel you have this ability, please see Martin. Martin has a sign-up sheet. It's just a number from the first five, if they show up, will be the, com the contestants, if for reasons completely understandable, you can say you had to spend more time with your family, <laughs> um, you're not able to make it, then people will be pulled from the standby list. That's it. That's, that's exactly what it is. This event's <coughs> happening tomorrow at, I believe, 8 p.m. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing what blood hits the green screen. Thank you. <laughs> The Wyrick effect. The, All right. The sign up will be here this afternoon and then we'll post it upstairs on the uh, whiteboard. Oh, this is pretty feedback resistant as long as you don't walk right in front of the speaker. <laughs> so, anybody else? New products? Come on down! And he's running out here. He's excited. <laughs> Can I get this attached by any chance? Oh, uh, yes. 
the other well Okay, so this is a was image of, an ori of the original Choplifter by Broderbund, um, by Dan Gorlin. If you try to boot it in, on an Apple IIe, and I can actually show you this upstairs because I found an original Choplifter in the, in the giveaway, and I have an enhanced IIe upstairs. Uh, but this is what happens. Uh, it, you, it, it gets a, a little way through the boot, and then uh, it has this M, and then it reboots. That is not a flaw in the emulation. That is not a flaw on the disk. That is a flaw of your machine because the copy protector, Roland Gustafson, um, programmed in a white list of ROM signatures that covered the Apple II, the Apple II Plus, and the Apple III and Apple II emulation mode. Then the Apple IIe came out and it looked like that because they changed that part of the ROM and his copy protection failed and Broderbund went Aah! and they re-released some, some but not all of their affected games. Choplifter, of course, was a big hit, so they did re-release Choplifter without this ROM whitelist. However, there are a number of other games in the Apple II universe from the early 80s, very early 80s, that will only work on an Apple II or an Apple II Plus, generally due to copy protection, either ROM whitelisting or they used um, undocumented opcodes that were then changed in the 65 CO2, so they'll work on uh, the 2E, but not the enhanced 2E, and then not the 2C or the 2GS. There were other things, weirdness, of course, you know, with the Disk 2 controller, which was then rewritten for the uh, later versions of the 2C and the 2GS with the new smart port, integrated WAS machine. Uh, anyone who knows about disks can tell you about smart port, but it was mostly backward compatible, except where it wasn't. <laughs> so you have this corpus of games that, because of all the copy protection edge cases, fail to work, original disks fail to work on genuine Apple machines. So, we have fixed that with a program called Anti-M, which will allow you to boot original disks, or in this case, um, WAS images, uh, copy protection included, of original disks, um, on your 2E, enhanced 2E, 2C, 2GS. And here you see, lo and behold, we have booted the disk image through Anti-M and it got past the ROM check because we boot traced it long enough to disable it and then just let the rest of the game load. Um, so we got that far. This is a, a joint effort at this point between Peter Ferry and myself. Uh, as you might expect, we've done joint efforts before. And then we're like, well, there's some other games, like I mentioned, uh, you know, some games that don't work on the smart port. So he wrote his own boot prom. I know. He wrote his own boot prom, so now you can boot things like Spyro Disk on a 2GS, whereas before it would give you a timeout message looking for the, the boot sector. And then uh, we're like, well, there's all these old 13 sector disks that required the, the really old 13 sector disk drives. And then you, so like you, then on the system master disk, there was a boot 13 program that you could run and then you can insert your old 13 sector disk. So uh, Antium can also boot 13 sector disks on 16 sector drives. And there's a number of other, we, we have uh, a complete uh, list on GitHub. <coughs> if I have Wi-Fi. Um, 
I do not. I do not have Wi-Fi. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Anyway, uh, that, but that's the URL. Uh, if you can see it, uh, anti-m, you can uh, search for it on GitHub. And it will basically, uh, the, the design goal is to allow you to boot any Apple II disk, original disk, on any Apple II, even if the copy protection uh, was being dumb or the uh, developers were not being forward thinking. Um, oh, hey, look, we do. Okay. So here is the list of games that are supported. A lot of serious games, serious software, because uh, the copy protector that they used for a lot of their original game, uh, early games, really liked those undocumented opcodes, and then all of them broke. Um, Broderbund, a lot of Broderbund, a lot of Gabelli used the same uh, thing. A lot of from online systems, a couple from Sensible Software and Cavalier, and then all 13 sector disks, as I mentioned, including a lot of early Epic stuff uh, and Eduware stuff. Oh, and all Prodos disks. That um, uh, Prodos, I don't know if you know this. Uh, uh, later versions had, and some earlier versions had um, uh, copy protection against clones, Apple II clones. And so uh, Antm will actually boot trace uh, any Prodos disk and uh, bypass that so that you can boot um, protected disks that you couldn't otherwise patch like Math Shop and a bunch of e educational software in the uh, mid to late 80s was based on Prodos and therefore inherited this anti-clone DRM by default. Um, and so you can now boot, you know, on your Laser or your Peach or your Alfred or you know whatever, Provitz, you know, all the all the the clones that came out. Um, that's it. Uh, it's open source. Uh, it's been through a couple of releases already. Uh, there's a disk image you can just download if you don't care about the source code, uh, and uh, try it out. Thank you. Any